Hello, my name is Magnus Petersen. This is my tutorial number 21 on TensorFlow, and this is about machine translation, where we want to translate one written human language to another. It extends the previous tutorial number 20 on natural language processing, and you really should watch that tutorial first before you start with this one, because it explains all the basic ideas in more detail. The idea in that tutorial was to take an input text, which was a review of a movie, for example, this one, this is not a very good movie, then process it using a so-called recurrent neural network, and then output a number, whether this was a positive or a negative sentiment in this movie review. What we want to do in this tutorial here on machine translation is basically an extension of that idea. So let's look at the flowchart here. What we want to translate is a text from Danish, which is my native language. And in this example here, we take the text der var en gang. And the literal translation is there was once. And we want our model to be able to translate this to English. The correct English translation of this is once upon a time. So we want our model to map der var en gang to once upon a time. The overall structure of this neural network is to have what is called an encoder, which is this box over here, and a decoder, which is this box over here. Both of these are recurrent neural networks, and they are connected with this thought vector. So the encoder is like the network you saw in the previous tutorial, which does sentiment analysis. But instead of outputting whether the input text is positive or negative, the network here outputs what we call a thought vector, which is an array of floating point numbers roughly between minus one and one, which summarizes the contents or the meaning or the intention of the input text. We then use this thought vector as the initial state for the recurrent units in the decoder part of the network. And then we start by inputting a marker, which we have taken to be four S's because it doesn't exist in the vocabulary for the data set. And given this initial state, which is the thought vector summarizing the input text and the start marker, we want the decoder to output the word once. In the next time step, we then input the same initial state, the thought vector, but now we have both the start marker and the word once. And then we want the network to produce the word upon. And then we input the start marker, once, upon, and hopefully that outputs the word A. Then we input these four words here, and hopefully we get the word time out. And then we input all of these words again, and then hopefully we get the end marker out, which we have taken to be four E's because it also does not exist in the vocabulary for the data set. Now there's a lot of details in this, and there's even more than I have shown here, but I'll just go over some of the basic things here. As you may remember from the previous tutorial, the recurrent units cannot work directly on text data. So we have a two-step process to convert it to numbers that the neural network can work on. The first step is to use what is called a tokenizer. And this basically just turns words into integers. And we need a tokenizer for the source language, which is Danish here. And we need another tokenizer for the destination language, which is English, because they have different vocabularies. So if we take the words in the input text, the word der becomes the integer token 12, and the word va becomes the integer token 54, and the word in gang becomes the integer token 1097. And the tokens are enumerated according to their frequency in the data set that we are using. So the word der occurs very frequently because it has the number 12. The, this word here also occurs quite frequently, but this word here does not occur very often. And typically we will limit the vocabulary to only, for example, the first 10,000 or if you build a large model, maybe you use 100,000 words. But in this example, we just use the first 10,000 words. But the neural network can still not work on integers. And I explained this in more detail in the previous tutorial. And so we have to convert each of these integers into a vector of floating point numbers, roughly between minus one and one, so that the neural network can work on it. And this embedding layer is also different for the encoder and the decoder because they work on different languages. And the embedding layer learns semantic similarities between words. And again, this is discussed in more detail in the previous tutorial, but it will learn that certain words have a tendency to occur in the same situations. So they probably have the same semantic meaning. 
And another thing you should note is that the tokenizer is applied outside of the neural network because there's no need to do this every time we run data through the neural network. So we just process the data once. So the neural network actually only consists of the embedding layer and then three layers of gated recurrent units. And we use these instead of LSTMs because we want to set the initial state for the recurrent units in the decoder. And the LSTM has actually two internal states. And this means we would be forced to take out the last internal state for the last recurrent unit here and use that as a thought vector and the initial state in the decoder. When we use the gated recurrent unit, it's a lot easier. We can either use the internal state or we can just use the output. In either case, we get a vector out which has the size of the internal state of the gated recurrent unit. And because it only has one internal state, we just need one vector to initialize it. Now what we get out of the final layer of recurrent units is a sequence. This is opposed to the encoder which only outputs one vector and not a sequence of vectors because we only need one thought vector to summarize the contents of the input text. But now we want to generate a sequence of words ultimately. So if the internal state of the gated recurrent units have say 256 elements and we have a vocabulary in the destination language of for example 10,000 words then we somehow need to convert this vector of 256 elements to a number between 1 and 10,000. One way of doing that is with the so-called one-hot encoded arrays that we have used in many of the previous tutorials. So basically we want to output a vector with 10,000 elements and we take the index of the highest element and this is the integer that we want to output. So this is not shown in complete detail down here because the flowchart was already very large and complicated, but you have to imagine that these dense layers map from a vector that is 256 elements long to a vector that is 10,000 elements long so that we can take the arc max and get an integer out. And then we can use the tokenizer again to convert that to the original word. I know this looks very complicated and Actually, there's not really any good tutorials on this, either written or on YouTube. So I had to piece this together from many different sources and it took me quite a while to make it and make it work because Keras actually also has a few bugs in it, as you will see further below. So I hope it makes sort of sense and you shouldn't feel bad if this doesn't make sense to you in like five minutes, okay? You might have to spend several hours trying to figure out how this tutorial works. Okay, so let's look at the implementation. So as usual, we have a bunch of imports and we need quite a lot from Keras this time. The data set we will be using is called Europal and this is from the European Union, from the parliament, I guess, where they have to translate between all the different languages in the member countries of the European Union. Funny thing is, I actually know the people who wrote this. When I lived in Luxembourg, I think maybe seven years ago, I was a member of a hiking club. And most of the people in the hiking club were retired people from the European Union, and a lot of them were translators. So the data that we will be using here was actually produced by people I knew when I lived in Luxembourg. I think that's a little funny. Now I have made this Python module called Europal, so it's easy to use it in different programs. Now the data set consists of matching sentence pairs between English and some other language. So it's English versus German, English versus Danish, English versus French, and so on. You have to write the correct language code, which is two characters. And if we go to the Python module here, you will see a whole list of the language codes. And I have actually been to most of these countries. And I debated a little with myself if I should go into a political rant in this tutorial. I think I will, but I'll make it short. Western Europe is fucked. For 30 years, we have had extremely weak and uninformed politicians. Now, Denmark has actually contributed a lot to the world. We are only about 5 million people. We have nine Nobel Prizes in science. A lot of large companies are Danish. For example, the transportation company Mask, the medicinal company Novo Nordisk. Skype was invented by a Danish man and a Swedish man, I think. We have had many important scientists way back in history that died many years before the Nobel Prize was even invented. And I am a bit sorry to say this, but Sweden is actually even a cooler country that has contributed even more than Denmark. The Nobel Prize is Swedish. The man who invented it was called Alfred Nobel. I saw his last residence last year when I was in Sweden. 
Sweden is a country of about 10 million people, and they can build their own fighter jet planes. Now, how cool is that? And 30 years ago, Sweden was probably one of the best countries on the entire planet. They had a supreme culture. It was a safe country. Everybody had a chance of a good life in Sweden. Everybody was taken care of. Now, Sweden is the biggest shithole in Europe, okay? Hand grenade attacks, gang rapes, murders, robberies. Those are completely common in Sweden now. And I gotta tell you, Swedish men are the biggest manginas in the world that they haven't protected their country. And it's gonna get a lot worse. England is almost as bad. It's slightly different. The violence is more extreme in England, but they have movements there that are not as delusional as they are in Sweden. In Sweden, they don't even think they have a culture. And what little culture they think they have, they think is inferior to everybody else's. Swedish men, man the fuck up. You are a disgrace. And I gotta tell you, in 30 years from now, the best country in Europe is gonna be this one, Poland. They are 40 million people, they work hard, they weren't even affected by the financial crisis that we had almost 10 years ago, and they are nationalistic, and they protect their country. Now, the Mangina left wing in Europe think that's a bad thing. It's not. You not only have a right, you have a duty and an obligation to protect yourself, your family, your country, and your culture. Europe has contributed immensely to the development of the entire planet. All of that is now jeopardized because our weak-ass pussy politicians have let in people that will shoot us with an 8K47 if we say something they don't like. Fuck you! Okay, I need to cool down for a moment before I continue with this. Okay, so I cooled down a little. Still angry though, okay? Don't get me started again. So let's continue. <laughs> so anyway, we import this module. We set the language code to DA for Danish, while this language still exists. We need to set a marker for the beginning of a sentence and the end. And these have to be words that do not occur in the dataset. And it's highly unlikely that these words are in the dataset. You can change the directory for the data if you want to. And then you can automatically download the data if you don't have it already. I should warn you that it's almost 600 megabytes. And when it's downloaded, we can load the data for the source language and the destination language. So here I have set the source language to be Danish and the destination language to be English. This means that we will train our model to translate from Danish to English. If you want to translate from English to Danish, you just exchange the source and destination here. So here is an example of some data. So the source text is this, and I can read it for you if you want to hear what Danish sounds like. Som de kan se, indfandt det store og 2000 problemer så ikke. Til gengæld har borgerne i en del af medlemslandene været ramt af meget forfærdelige naturkatastrofer. And this is the English translation, which has been marked with the start and end markers. And I have checked it and it's an accurate translation. Now, this is a very large data set, so there's probably going to be some errors in it. And I just happened to stumble upon this one. So this is supposed to be Danish, but this text here, I think this is French. I don't speak French, so I'm not 100% sure. It looks French. And then you have the Danish text down here. And then you have the English translation here. The model is probably going to get confused when it sees this, but the data set is extremely large, so hopefully we have enough data that something like this doesn't mess it up too badly. I'm not going to go over 2 million sentences in the data set and check if everything is right. So now we come to the tokenizer, and remember that this converts text words into integer tokens, and we set the max size of our vocabulary both for the source and destination languages to 10,000, you can try with a larger number here. And we need a few extensions to Keras tokenizer class. So we just wrap the class here and implement a little extra. Some of this is a little weird that is not already in Keras. For example, this one here where we can do the inverse mapping. So we take from an integer token and back to a word. I can't find that in the Keras API, so we add it here. But I think there are several things here that really should be added to Keras, but I don't really have time. So if you want to take credit for it, go ahead and add this to the Keras API. One thing we will do is to reverse the sequences of integer tokens in the source text 
And this is because some research literature has found that if you do that, then the model becomes better at translating. If we go back and look at the flowchart, remember that it processes the data in time steps. So the recurrent units first see the token for this word here, the second word and the third word. But if this word matches this word over here and this one matches the next one and so on, then they are actually far apart in terms of processing. If we reverse the sequence of integer tokens, the words in the source and destination languages will be closer to each other. So the model supposedly becomes better at learning these short-term dependencies of the words. And let's go back down to the tokenizer class and we just add a few more functions that we will need. Then we apply this tokenizer to all the input text in the source language, which is Danish here. And we say that we want pre-padding and we want to reverse the sequences of integer tokens as I just explained, and then the max number of words in our vocabulary. And this takes a few minutes to process. And then we do the same for the destination language, which is English here. But now we have the padding to post and we don't want to reverse the sequences of integer tokens. So let's see an example of the sequences of integer tokens that we get out. So this sequence here, which starts with a lot of zeros, and then we have a bunch of integers here. So each of these represent a word in the source language. And if we use one of our new functions in the tokenizer class, we can actually map this back to words and all of the zeros are just ignored. And then we get this text out here and we can compare it with the actual text from the data set. And what we see is that it has been reversed. So this word here is at the end here and the beginning here. This word here matches here, 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 and so on. And this one here matches the beginning here. So it's just reversed like I explained. And we can also see an example for the destination language, which is English. And here we have the zeros at the end instead of the beginning. And I also explained this in more detail in the previous tutorial, why it is important to have this at the right side, depending on how we process the data. So if we translate this back to words, we will get this text here. And this should match exactly the text and the data set, except all the punctuation marks have been removed and words that are not in our vocabulary are ignored. Remember, we only use the 10,000 most frequent words. So if there are words that are used infrequently, then they may be ignored. For example, this one here, dreaded millennium buck. Those are fairly rare words, so they are not in our vocabulary. So they are ignored up here in the text that we will work on. So the data we will use for training the neural network are all these tokenized and padded and truncated sequences. And if we go back and look at the flowchart, we will need to input three sequences to the neural network when we are training it. The first sequence is the input to the encoder. So it is this sequence here, 1254, 1097. The second input is this array of integers here, 2, 3, 3, 7, 6, 40, 9, 79, 3. And the last one is this array of integers down here. And these are identical, except one has been time shifted one step. So notice that 337 is the same as this one here. 640 is the same here. 9 is the same here, and so on. And if we go back down and look at the code, the best way to do that is simply just to use one big NumPy array and then take what is called a slice because it's just a different view of the same data in memory. So we don't have to use twice as much memory when we just slice it like this. And we can see an example here. So we have one sequence of integers here, and this is for the input to the decoder. And the output for the decoder is the same sequence. It is just shifted one time step. And we can again use the tokenizer to convert this back to words. And you will see that the only difference is that this marker here for S's has been removed from this text down here. Okay, so we now get to the point where we will create the neural network. And we will split this in two, the encoder and the decoder. The decoder needs an input and the shape is set to none, which means it can be a batch of sequences of arbitrary length. And then we define that we want 128 elements in an embedding vector. So this means that an integer token for a word will be converted to a vector that has 128 numbers that are roughly between minus one and one. And again, you should watch the previous tutorials for a deeper explanation of what this embedding does but it essentially tries to map words in the vocabulary to a position in a vector space where words with similar semantic meaning, that means they occur in sort of the same context, 
that they have sort of similar mappings in the vector space. Then we create an embedding layer. And now we get to the point where we will create all the gated recurrent units for the three recurrent layers. We say that we want the internal state size and the output of these gated recurrent units to be 512. So these are vectors of 512 elements, and we create three layers here. Now we have used the functional API in Keras to construct this neural network, and we haven't actually connected the layers yet. The reason that we use this API is that we need it for creating the decoder, as you will see in a moment. And for consistency, I thought it was better to use the functional API instead of mixing the sequential and the functional. But also, if you want to experiment and connect the encoder in different ways, this gives you more flexibility. But now we have to connect all the layers. And again, for consistency, because we do it in a similar way for the decoder further down, I have made this little helper function, connect encoder. So we start the neural network with its input. Then we connect the embedding layer, the first recurrent layer, the second, the third. And then we take the output of the encoder to be the output of the third recurrent unit. And if we just go back up a little, remember that the first two recurrent layers return sequences of vectors that are 512 elements long, but the last recurrent layer only returns a single vector of 512 elements because this is our thought vector. So if we go back to the flowchart, the first recurrent layer has to return a sequence of vectors like here. The second recurrent layer also has to return a sequence of vectors like here, but the third one only returns a single vector, which is a thought vector that we can then use as the initial state for the recurrent layers in the decoder, as you will see how we do right now. So let's go back down to the code where we will create the decoder and we do it in a similar way. So first we define the input layer for the decoder's initial state. We also need an input layer for taking sequences of integer tokens. And then we need another embedding layer for the decoder. And this is different from the one in the encoder because we are using different vocabularies for different languages. And then we need three layers of recurrent units. Notice here that the all output sequences corresponding to how you saw in the flowchart that we want the decoder to output a sequence of words ultimately, but the recurrent units output a sequence of vectors with 512 elements. And we want to transform this into one hot encoded arrays with 10,000 elements so that we can take the index of the largest element. And this is our integer token for the output word. Normally, when we are training a network that has a one hot encoding, we will use a softmax excavation function that compresses all of the output. So it's between zero and one. And so that the sum is one. And you can see this in plenty of the other tutorials, but there is a bug in Keras. So we have to make a custom loss function. And I will get back to that in a moment, how we do that. But we will use TensorFlow and TensorFlow's function for making that loss has the softmax applied internally. So we cannot apply it twice. And that's why we only have a linear activation here. And once again, we have a helper function for actually connecting all of these layers. And this time we can supply an initial state, which means that we can connect different inputs for the initial state to the decoder. It will use the same underlying neural network. So the same weights that we are training, but we just connect different inputs to it. But every time we do that, we have to connect all the way through the neural network. And that's why I think it's helpful to have this little function here for doing it. So we start with the input layer for the decoder network. Then we connect the embedding layer. Then we connect all the recurrent layers and then we connect the final fully connected or dense layer and we take that as the input. So this is the one hot encoded array that we get as output. And then we connect the final dense or fully connected layer so that we get the one hot encoded array as output. We now want to create three models where we connect this in different ways. And if we go back and look at the flowchart, it's easier to explain here. We want one model just for the encoder so that we supply it with a sequence of integer tokens and we get the thought vector as output. And then we can use it for whatever we like. We want a second model for the decoder where we give it some initial state as input, whatever vector we like. And then we get a sequence of one hot encoded arrays as output. And then we want a third model which combines the encoder and decoder. So we give it a sequence of integer tokens as input and we get a sequence of one hot encoded arrays as output. And this model we will use to train. 
And once again, the three models will actually use all the same weights and variables for the gated recurrent units and the dense layers and so forth and the embedding layer and everything. We just wrote all the input and output differently. So if we go back down to the code, here we connect the decoder so that the initial state of the decoder is the output of the encoder. And then we use Keras to construct a model that we can train. The next one here is for the encoder. And this is easier because we just say that we want a Keras model that takes the input of the encoder and gives us the output of the encoder. The last one here is a model just for the decoder. And then again, we have to connect the decoder so that the initial state is connected to an input layer. It might sound a little confusing, but you will see further below that we use this for different things. Before we can train a model in Keras, we have to compile it first. We have to say which optimizer we want to use and which loss function. And Keras actually has a built-in sparse categorical cross entropy loss function, and it's supposed to work, but it doesn't. And I think it is because that the decoder actually outputs a three rank tensor that confuses Keras. The first dimension is for the batch size. The second is for the sequence length. And the third one is for the number of words in the one hot encoded arrays. And we will compare this to only a two rank tensor where the first dimension is for the batch size and the second is for the sequence length. So this has sequences of integer tokens. And the reason that we want to use this sparse loss function function is that we don't want to convert all our data into one hot encoded arrays. It would be extremely wasteful for the memory. And there is another way, which is we could make a data generator. And you will see an example of that in the next tutorial. But there's really no need to do that because all we need to do is use a sparse loss function instead. And TensorFlow actually has one built into it that works like it should, even for these outputs from recurrent units. So we have to wrap that in another function, which we call sparse cross entropy, which takes two parameters so that it matches the Keras API. And then we call this function from TensorFlow, which calculates the sparse cross entropy correctly. And this one, like I said before, calculates the softmax internally in order to improve the robustness of the floating point operations or something like that. Now this outputs a two rank tensor of shape, batch size and sequence length. So it gives us the loss value in like a matrix. And Keras may reduce this on the first axis for the batch, but the semantics are unclear. So just to be sure that we calculate our loss function across all of the data that we are interested in, so that we are trying to train our decoder to output all the correct integer tokens in the sequences and not just the first tokens in each sequence or something like that. So we do that very simply by just reducing this entire matrix by taking the average. So we get out a single number and then TensorFlow can calculate the gradient of this single number and propagate that gradient backwards and use that for training the neural network using gradient descent as we are used to. So there's another problem because Keras cannot recognize the correct shapes because the output of the decoder is a three rank tensor, but the data that we want it to match with is a two rank tensor. So Keras gets confused and we have to provide it with this placeholder variable from TensorFlow so that when we compile the model, we say to Keras that the target tensors are actually taken from this placeholder variable here. It's confusing and I'll admit that I don't understand 100% why it's being done like this. Again, I think it's because there are some bugs in Keras, but the API is not clear on these issues. And to be quite honest, the Keras code is actually not very good. It's almost completely undocumented. So it's really hard to understand what the code is doing and more importantly, what is the intention of the code? And this is some of the stuff you're not going to find any other tutorial than this one that actually gets all of this working. If you find tutorials on the internet, it's going to be little toy examples with tiny little data sets and it doesn't really scale to this size or anything like that. So it took me quite a while to get all of this working because the concept of machine translation using recurrent neural networks is fairly complicated by itself, but there are so many implementation details and there are bugs in Keras, so it took a while. Okay, so we add a few callback functions before we actually do the training. We want to save a checkpoint after each epoch of training so that we can easily reload it later. 
we want to do early stopping. This is in case you're running this on a machine, you just set it to run for a week. You don't want it to overfit, so you can use early stopping to do that. It monitors the loss value on the validation set, and if that hasn't improved for three epochs, then it stops the optimization. Finally, we also want to save a lock for TensorBot so that we can use TensorBot to see what has happened during training. And if you want to load a checkpoint that you have saved during training previously, you do it with this code here. And then you can either continue training or you can just run the model and use it for translating texts. So one last step before we start training is that we just wrap all the input data in these named dictionaries here so that we are sure that the data goes to the correct inputs in the model. And then we can train the model. And this took one hour per epoch on my GTX 1070 GPU. And I ran it for 10 epochs. And that produced the results that you will see in a moment. You can try running it for longer and see if that improves the results. So once the model has trained, we want to use it for translating texts. We make this helper function for that. The function takes an input text that we want to translate and an optional output text, which is the true translation or the correct translation. So we just print them side by side and we can see what was the intended translation compared to the output of the model. The first step is that we need to convert the input text, which is a string. And remember that the model has been trained on reversed input sequences. So we need to do that here as well. And we also pad it with zeros, although I'm not sure that is really necessary. This gives us a sequence of integer tokens corresponding to the input text. Then we input this to the encoder model, and then we get the thought vector of the encoder as output, and we call this the initial state. So if we go back to the flowchart, what we have done now is that we have first converted our input text to a sequence of integer tokens. We have run it through our encoder, and this has output a thought vector that we will now use as the initial state in the decoder. Now, the way we're going to do that is actually we're going to start building this input sequence of integer tokens. So we start with the token for the start marker, and then we input the initial state, and we want to get the integer token out here. And then in the next step, we will add that token to the input sequence, put that through the decoder model again, and then we get another integer token out. We will add that to the input sequence and so on and so forth. We will repeat this until we reach the token for the end marker or until we reach some number, let's say 30 words or whatever. So we don't do this indefinitely. So we initialize the sequence of integer tokens that are going to be input to the decoder here. And the decoder expects a whole batch of sequences, but we only have one sequence. So we just use this shape of the array here. And then there's a bunch of little details and I won't go into all of the details, but then we basically just have the loop that I just explained up in the flowchart. So we prepare the data, then we input it to the decoder. Then we get a sequence of one hot encoded arrays as output, and we are actually only only interested in the last of these one hot encoded arrays because we already know the other ones. So imagine that we have already run this loop five times. We already know what has been output the first five steps. We are only interested in the last step now. And this is wasteful that we are inputting the whole input sequence to the decoder again and again and again. However, the code would get a lot more complicated if we had to get the internal state of the recurrent units out and then feed them back in when we take another step of the decoder. We would have to get it out here from the predict and then we have, would have to feed it back in with the X data. It's a bit of a mess and I'm not even sure it's faster, at least not for short sequences. And if you're running this on a GPU, you can do it as an experiment or an exercise and see if it's better, but it's certain that your code is going to be a lot more complicated. It of course makes sense if you are building like Google Translate and you have to serve a million queries every minute or whatever. It has to be very efficient, but it makes the code a lot more complicated. And I think it's complicated enough already if you want to learn how this works. So anyway, we have a one hot encoded array now. We take the argmax to get the index of the highest number in this array. And this is then the integer token. And then we use the tokenizer for the destination language to map that back to a word and then we add that to the output text. So we basically just repeat this loop a number of times until it either reaches the end token or the maximum number of tokens that we want in the output text. Then we print the input text, the translated output text that we have just generated and the optional true output text. 
So let's try and run this on a few examples. And here we have some text from the data set that we use for training. And the true translation is this one down here. And the machine translation is this one here. And these are fairly close. They are not exactly the same. And there are some details that are missing like this in the course of the next few days that has been removed. But the overall meaning of the text has been captured. So this is promising that the idea seems to work so let's take another example. And once again, the translated text is actually quite decent. Although instead of something with terrible storms, which is like a natural disaster, it has translated it as victims of the atrocities that have been committed in the member states. So it's not exactly correct. But another interesting thing is that it doesn't have the same translation down here. It's the same meaning in the member states. It's the same meaning as in the various countries of the European Union. And I can tell you that the Danish word uses the word here, Medlemslande, which is member countries. That's the literal translation. So it uses synonyms for the same thing. And even though this text has been used during training, this is evidence that it doesn't just remember word for word what should the mapping be. It actually learns something about the contents of the source text and how to translate that into the destination text. However, I should say that this is not a human like understanding. This is a very clever and highly advanced form of a function approximator that can map one sequence of integers to another sequence of integers. That's all it does. It's just highly advanced. So here's an example where I have concatenated two texts from the training data and then translated those as if it's one text. And it sort of blends it a little together, but it seems to be able to capture both meanings concurrently in the thought vector and then decoding that again. It is not as clear as in the human translation of this text, but it's in the right direction. Interestingly, if we reverse the order of these sentences that we have concatenated, then the translation becomes a little worse. So here is a little example that I have made up. The Danish text is this and a correct translation is once there was a country named Denmark and the machine translation is there was a country that Denmark was once again. That's not exactly correct, but I guess it's in the right direction. And this text I have also made up and this is actually a little more complicated. The correct translation is that today you can read in the newspaper that Denmark has become sensible. And I guess that is a subconscious political statement that finally the left-wing politicians have started to man up a little in Denmark. But anyway, the model has translated the Danish sentence to can you read in the newspapers that Denmark has been sensible. So this is not completely off. It's not completely correct either, but it's sort of. You get the gist of what the meaning is. And this one <laughs> is a text from a Danish dance hall song. Hvem spænder ud af en butik og tykker de stærkeste bolsje? And this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense in Danish either. The literal translation is who runs out of a shop and choose the strongest bonbons. This is like a funny spin on like hip hop, like trying to be really cool. So they are saying I'm really tough because I can chew really strong hard candy. And this is a kind of candy that we have in Denmark called salty licorice, which has something called ammonium chloride inside it. I think that's what the joke is about. And this is also used in cleaning fluid because it's very, very strong. Uh, it's not exactly like chili powder, but it, it, it burns a little like that. And usually it's only people in Scandinavia and Northern Germany that like this kind of candy. And right now I'm in Greece and I had a supply with me, but in Greece you cannot get this anywhere. So now I have a big problem, yes? But anyway, the machine has translated this, who is by A and by the powerful. A problem you have here is probably that several of these words are not in the vocabulary. They probably didn't even occur in the training data. Spana, which means run, Tuga, which means chew, and Balcha, which means bong bong or hard candy. So a lot of these words are unknown. So these are just blank in the translation. What it did get right was who, which is this word here, and powerful, which is this word here. So that was right. Anyway, we have showed you the basic idea of how to use recurrent neural networks to do machine translation using a so-called encoder and decoder architecture. You can try this on different languages, different data sets, 
you should try building different and better models. There are far more sophisticated models that use like attention encoding and whatnot. But these are the basic ideas and you can see if you can improve on them. It is important to understand that these models do not actually understand the language. Like I said before, they are just a very advanced way of mapping from one sequence of integers to another sequence of integers. It's still pretty cool that it works, but it has limitations. As usual, you can download this tutorial by clicking on the link below the video.